about resection or resect and so on. So the section then is the uh, curve that you see if you imagine cutting into this double cone in any of the ways that the three pictures indicate. So if you, if you think of the left-hand picture and your cutting plane cuts in at an angle to the vertical axis, then you get the ellipse. If you were to cut through right where the two, the upper half and the lower half, the, the actual word for half of the double cone is nap, N-A-P-P-E. But anyway, if you cut right in the middle there, you get a point. So a point can be a conic section. Think of it as a circle with zero radius, say. And if your cutting plane, like in the left-hand picture at the bottom, um, I guess that's labeled C in that book, um, comes in at right angles to the vertical axis, you get a circle. So in a sense, then, a circle is a special case of an ellipse, where the two, well, we'll talk later about that. Okay, look at the center picture. If your cutting plane cuts one nap, as it's called, one half of the double cone, and it's coming in at the same angle that would be the edge of the double cone, so it's the line that would be the edge of the double cone is parallel to this plane. In that case, you get a parabola. And if you cut at a different angle, so that you cut both cones, like the right-hand picture, you get a hyperbola. So a hyperbola is not the same curve, really, as half. Uh, the, the parabola is not really the same curve as half of a hyperbola. They're, they're a different curve, although they're somewhat similar looking. So anyway, uh, also the book that I've copied here doesn't show it, but you could imagine slicing uh, along that vertical axis from top to bottom, in which case what you get is two lines that make kind of an X, like um, Like so. So you could have intersecting lines as a conic section. And finally, if your cutting plane just touched uh, the edge, you'd have a single line. So all of these things are um, conic sections in that sense. So the general, most general formula uh, involves x square and xy and y square and x and y and the constant. Um, notice if you turn the page, obviously this is copied from the paper and uh, goes back to when parade amounted to more than it does now in the paper. You can hardly find it anymore, but it used to actually be sort of a real magazine. Well, the reason I copied this picture, the uh, <clears throat> Arizona's new uh, freeway below the Hoover Dam that uh, you see there, is the arch is a beautiful picture, really, of a parabola. It turns out that the shape that for which you would have minimum stress from the load um, is a parabola. Either if it's supporting like this, or if you have the whole thing flipped over and it's the cables of a suspension bridge supporting the roadway with cables instead of below it. Either way, what you want is a parabolic shape to 
have the uh, least tension in the cables if it's a bridge or in the arch and the concrete, say, and so on if it's uh, supporting like that. So the, the conic sections are important because there are lots of applications such as lenses and aerials and so on like that. Um, so if you uh, start out with the parabola definition, it's the locus. Locus is a Latin word that it is the same as saying the the curve that some uh, figure will follow. <clears throat> so it's the curve, if you like, that the points P uh, with coordinates X, Y will uh, trace out when the ratio, which is called eccentricity, and we write the letter E, of distances P F to P D equal one, as in this picture that's up here. So thinking of the parabola, uh, F is a fixed point, which we call the focus. And uh, if you're thinking of it like a lens, just a second here. In of this um, geometric figure. This is our actual parabola here in black. If you're thinking of it like a lens, you could think of it, for example, if it's a mirror and you have light rays coming down from up above um, as parallel lines, then this is the shape of the lens that or of the mirror, in that case, that would focus all of the light rays into the same point called the focus. That would be the basis of, <clears throat> say, a reflecting uh, telescope. On the other hand, if you action, then you could think of light rays coming into the lens on this side, like I'm showing with the stick, and uh, it would bend all of them to the one point which we call the focus. And so that's the idea of focusing, of course. And that's what uh, people's glasses do, or a refracting telescope, or binoculars, or something like that. Uh, on the other hand, if you think of a uh, source of light, thinking of, say, the reflector in a flashlight or your car headlights or something like that, to the extent that you can think of it as at a point, then the light rays come out. And if this is a mirror type of surface, there'll be reflected in more or less parallel lines to form a beam of light. It isn't, of course, 100 percent exact because your bulb has finite size. It's not literally a point, but it's the, certainly uh, a pr about right, and it's, it's the idea. So there's a reason, in other words, you call this point focus. So we, what we do to construct the parabola, we say we think of a line here, uh, we identify a point that's to be the focus, F. From it, we have a distance D1 to a point that's on this uh, parabolic curve. And then from P, we have a distance D2 to a line that's at right angles to the line on which we have the original focus. We call that line the directrix, and the parabola is the curve where 
the distance from focus to a point on the curve equals the distance from the point on the curve to the directrix, meaning the minimum distance, the distance where you come in at right angles. Um, this number that I mentioned here in the definition called eccentricity is the ratio of these two distances. Uh, this uh, idea of eccentricity as a ratio of distances, the point on the curve to focus to point on the curve to directrix, uh, carries forward not just with the parabola where the ratio is one, but with the other conic section curves that are over there under the clock, the ellipse and the hyperbola, where the ratio is less than one for the ellipse and greater than one for the hyperbola. This is important because we use the um, definition, we use the eccentricity in uh, studying conic sections in polar coordinates, which we'll be doing next week. And that's important because um, that's how you, well, uh, if you're thinking of gravity as being one, uh, the force of gravity as being proportional to one over the square distance between, say, the sun and the earth, or the earth and the moon, or whatever to whatever, then it's possible to prove, if that's the only kind of force that it is, that the path of an object like the Earth's orbit or the Moon's orbit has to be a conic section. And you can prove that the other way. If the path is a conic section, then the force has to be 1 over r square type and not 1 over the square root or the cube or something. That was the real triumph that of Sir Isaac Newton's calculus. That's what calculus was invented to do more than anything else, probably, in the late 1600s, because uh, Kepler, an astronomer, had taken very careful records and had shown experimentally that the paths uh, were uh, elliptical, and so the question is, if the path is a conic section, what kind of force is it? And uh, uh, by putting the uh, equation, by, by putting the equations of the curves that um, an object like the Earth would follow, or the moon around the Earth, or a satellite in orbit, by, by knowing that these orbits are conic sections, it's possible to prove that the force has to be 1 over r square. But you have to write the conic sections paths in polar coordinates to be able to do it. So there's uh, a lot of reason to study um, the um, ellipse, parabola, hyperbola in polar coordinates from the point of view of astronomy. So this is kind of why we're bothering with any of this. So anyway, <clears throat> um, let me show you if you have a setup like this, uh, what comes out as the um, equation that defines this curve that uh, we call a parabola. So the distance P to F, where F is the focus, would be, if, if this point has coordinates x, y, and you suppose that this has coordinate x equals 0 with your origin here, and that we suppose it's a distance P, from the origin to this focus point. So that 
the coordinates of this point are 0, P. So then uh, you have, from your distance formula, your squared distance D1, or P to F, if you prefer, uh, is X minus this X, which is 0, quantity square, plus Y minus this Y, which is P square. So this is also uh, D1 square. And in the same way, I'm thinking of this as measured vertically, so the x's are the same, so x minus x, so that's 0, and then y minus, I'm thinking of the directrix down here, so that this distance is the same as that. So if this is p, that's minus p. So y minus minus p. In other words, y, which is right in here, plus p. So your distance formula is that the square distance is this square plus that square. It's just a it's just right triangle law of Pythagoras. So then d one the definition of the parabola is that it's the figure where d1 equals d2, so of course the squares are equal. So then if you match these, which is x squared, and then I've squared this out, so I have y squared minus 2py plus p squared, and then I have 0 here, and then y plus p squared out. Okay. Then you have a y squared to cancel, and you have a p squared to cancel, and you can take this across, and so you get x squared equal 4py. So that's your um, formula for a parabola where the point called the vertex would be at the origin and where it opens upward. The parabola always opens over the focus. The focus is inside the figure. And um, <clears throat> the um, coefficient then on the y is four times the distance either from the focus to the vertex or the directrix to the vertex, which are equal distances. And, uh, the more general situation for the parabola would be that it has a vertex not at the origin, but some point h and k, like in these pictures. You see, there are four situations you could have. You can have an origin back here, and uh, the h and k could be anywhere. It's not necessarily uh, first quadrant, but I had to draw something. I had to put it somewhere. <laughs> and I can't, I don't have enough board to have it here and here and here and here, but you, you have to stretch your imagination that far. So then you could have the uh, vertex at H and K, the center line of your figure, you see the center line would look like my sketches here, I use this symbol for center line, and I'm assuming it's parallel either to the y-axis or to the x-axis. It's possible to talk about a parabola where the center line is not parallel, not vertical and not horizontal, where it's at an angle, but your book doesn't go that far. Um, at one, at one time, it was thought important to really go into that, uh, but um, most people don't run into problems where you really have to worry about the parabola where the center line is at an angle with either the x-axis or the y-axis. So, 
it's kind of gone out of fashion to, to teach that much. So we're thinking only of situations like this where the center line is vertical or where it's horizontal. So in that case, then you have just four situations where it opens downward instead of upward, where it opens to the right, where it opens upward, which is this, except that the um, uh, vertex is at HK instead of at the origin, or where it opens to the left. And it turns out that the general formula in, involving the H and the K and again the P, where P is the uh, focus to vertex distance, um, <clears throat> will look like this if it's opening downward. Uh, if it's opening to the right, then it's the Y that's square and the X that's the first power. And if it opens left, uh, you have a negative then on the X. If it's opening to the right, you have a um, um, positive on the coefficient on the X. And if it opens upward, like the, where we started, uh, you have this same formula, except you've changed the x into x minus h and the y into y minus k. So a plus on the coefficient of the uh, side of the equation that has only first power means either it opens upward or opens to the right, and minus means it opens downward or opens to the left. So these four formulas are your general situation for the parabola as far as our book goes into it. If you had the parabola, or the other conics for that matter, where uh, your center line is off is at an angle relative to x and y, say like along my stick, then there will be an xy term, a product term in the formula somewhere. So for example, xy equals 1 will be actually uh, a hyperbola where the center line is at a 45 degree angle and the x and y axes are the asymptotes which we'll talk about when we get there. So then let's go over to here. And uh, <clears throat> so this figure is what we call an ellipse. And there is a vertex here and here. The, uh, points on the end of the long way of the figure are given the name vertex and generally it would refer in this picture to either here or there but not to this point or that one. That's just kind of an agreement sort of thing. Um, the <coughs> find a place to uh, have a Latin class. So the Latin words that ended either in IX or EX would drop the X and the plural would be ICES. So vertices. The educated people and speak Latin formals, right? Okay. So we have vertex there and there. Uh, the center of the figure, 
and I'm taking the center at the origin first, and <clears throat> then to construct the lips, we identify two focal points at distances C from the center of the figure. So there's a focus there, and there's a focus there. The Latin words that ended in U.S. Uh, dropped that, and the plural is the I. And, uh, <clears throat> although you probably think I'm old enough that I should have, I really didn't live in ancient Rome. So I really don't know quite how they would have pronounced it. But people in this country usually would say foci. And uh, so you have the two of those. Well, from the two focal points, you can measure distances D1 and D2 that I have in orange to a point XY on the curve. So your definition of the uh, ellipse is that it's the curve that you get from the locus of points when the sum of the distances from the two focal points, d1 plus d2, equals a constant, and it's possible to show that that constant would be the distance from this vertex to this one, which would be 2a in my picture. And uh, so uh, we think of our center at the origin. We draw this line from vertex to vertex that we call the major axis. Uh, we identify the two focal points and take the distances from them, and the sum will equal this, then the, if you use that definition and go through something with the distance formula equivalent to what I did here, only more complicated and more time consuming, which means I'm not going to do it, but if you care, you can read it in the book, you can see the work, them work it out. Um, what you'll end up with is the standard form, as we call it, for the equation of the lips, which will uh, either look like this, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equal 1, where a will be the distance from the center to vertex on the major axis, B will be the distances out to the curve on what's called the minor axis. Um, the A square is greater than or equal to the B square. We have this relationship. And uh, you, you see this is something positive, so that means that this has to be greater than or equal to that. If the A and the B are equal, your ellipse is a circle. Um, so the way you tell um, which is A and which is B, of course, is which is larger. And the larger goes underneath the lever, X or Y, if you notice how I've written it, to which the major axis, the long axis, is parallel. So if your long way is this way in my picture, then the a square would be under the x square. And if it's turned the other way, so that the long way is vertical, then the a square will be under the y square. And as I said, when a is b, uh, the ellipse is a circle. And in that case, the eccentricity will be zero. Uh, in general, for the ellipse eccentricity, 
would be this ratio from <clears throat> uh, the, the focus to the point on the curve P, um, PF, to the point on the curve out to a directrix line, which would be over here, there'd be another one over here. But the people that run things here probably don't want me to mark up their walls, so I didn't draw that one. <clears throat> um, so when the ellipse, or when the long axis or the major axis is, is parallel to the axis x or y that's named by the lever that's the larger denominator is underneath. <clears throat> so we have two situations um, with center at H and K. Uh, the major axis can be parallel to the X axis. And then the A square is under the term that has the X in it. Or the major axis is parallel to the Y axis. And then the larger denominator which is the A square is under the letter that is the same letter name Y as the axis X or Y to which the long axis is parallel. And uh, <coughs> so then uh, this is supposed to have been a F and not a T there, that bothers me, that looked wrong. Yeah, that's the focus, so. So then finally we have the definition for hyperbole <coughs> as the locus of points such that the difference Remember that the definition here is the sum of distances is constant. Here it's the difference um, is a constant. The constant is positive, and uh, it depends on how you do things, which is greater between D1 and D2. So that's why the absolute value. <coughs> so if you take the center at the origin, and A, B, and C as I have it. So here's my picture. I take my center of the figure here, and C is the, always the distance to a focal point. Both the ellipse and the hyperbola have the two focal points, whereas the parabola has just the one focal point. <coughs> Uh, so then the parabola, or pardon me, the hyperbola rather, is the curve that looks something like this. And uh, <coughs> we have for our two distances, D1 and D2, say I take D1 from the left hand focus, for instance. So it's the longer, and I take D2 from the right-hand focus, so in my picture here it's the shorter, and then my D1 minus D2 would be positive in this picture, so I don't have to worry about the absolute value. Um, <coughs> so the points then, would be like the orange colored XY that follow this curve and then there's also the mirror image curve over here. If you're thinking of an object that's moving in space um, in the, under the influence of the gravitational field, say of the sun and so on, it's going to be on one branch of the hyperbola or the other. It's not going to hop across or something like that, but um, comets that come in from somewhere can be in a hyperbolic orbit, 
they also can be in a parabolic orbit, uh, uh, depending on how, what other forces are acting. <clears throat> so, uh, with the hyperbola, the, from the center to uh, where the curves on either side would come in to what is called the uh, transverse axis, what is called the major axis for the ellipse, and becomes the transverse axis for the hyperbola. No good reason, but somebody decided to call that major axis, and somebody decided to call that transverse axis, and it was stuck. Whoever the somebody was, was more influential than I, certainly. And I really don't know just who it might have been. So anyway, you can form a central rectangle, which can be a square, uh, as it looks in my picture here, which is 2A along the transverse axis and 2B along what is called the conjugate what's called the minor axis for the ellipse becomes the conjugate axis for the uh, hyperbola. And uh, then the diagonals that go through the corners of this central rectangle are what we call the asymptotes. Uh, the distance B then is not a distance at which your curve uh, ever crosses anything. Your, your curves never cross this conjugate axis. But it is a distance that you can measure out if you're forming this central rectangle. And if you do, then the diagonals through the corners uh, locate your asymptotes like these. So if the center here is at the origin, then this asymptote has slope B, which is like that, over A, which is like that, the blue over the green. And this one has formula Y equals B over A X, if this point here is the origin, and this is minus b over ax if the center is at the origin. Again, for the hyperbola, we define eccentricity <coughs> the same way, uh, pf over pd. So here's a point, say, on this side. Uh, this would be your directrix in here. pd would be the distance straight across like that, and P to F, this would be this focus. You can see that this is longer than that, that the ratio is greater than one. You also have the same thing here with this directrix. See, there are two of them for either the hyperbola or for the ellipse. I just didn't get the other one drawn. So then we can have the situation where the center is at HK. And again, we're thinking transverse axis is parallel either to the x-axis and the y-axis. The same as here, we're thinking of the major axis parallel either to the x-axis or to the y-axis. Uh, as I said with the, when we were talking about parabolas, we're not going as far as to worry about conics where they're rotated relative to the x and y axes. So we're not talking about a parabola where the center line's rotated at, say, a 45 degree angle, or where we're, talk we're not talking about an ellipse where the major axis would be at say a 45 degree angle to the x-axis, the uh, 
x-axis or y-axis. And we're not doing that with the hyperbola. Um, people used to put more, this, this kind of stuff is called analytic geometry. And people used to put more time in the studying analytic geometry than we do now because there's so much else to study. But um, when I went to college back before, well, back before colleges were even established, say, so long <laughs> ago, um, what we did is we took a semester of analytic geometry before we ever took any calculus. And uh, the Thomas book, as much as any, revolutionized that and combined the analytic geometry with calculus. And the focus has been more and more and more on calculus and vectors, say, which you'll get in the third semester, and less and less on analytic geometry. What we do now is we kind of say, well, yes, there's all this information, and we'll spend a day or two on it, get through with it, and so on. But it is important to, depending on what you're doing, I mean, if you're, the work, the analytic geometry with polar coordinates is very important if you're talking astronomy or flying rockets. Uh, you know, anything that has to do with um, working with gravitational fields and so on. So uh, it, you, you need to know something about it, kind of where to look at least. <clears throat> so anyway. I'm sorry, I have a question. How, you, big I'm sorry. How, how applicable uh, would that be to electronics, do you think? Well, it's a lot more so to optics. Okay. Yeah, I'd say. Um, I, I don't think that it's so much so to electronics or electrical engineering, but it, it certainly is to optics. And, it, and optics, of course, in the broad sense, which would include antenna design. So it, it, it's, it's vital if you're talking about designing antennas. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So it, it depends, as I'm trying to say, it depends on what you're doing, whether you really care about this stuff or not. Mm -hmm. but, but some people do, certainly. Uh, certainly, if you were going to optometry school, you, you're going to do a lot of optics, and you're going to suffer with a lot of this, so on. Um, so, if you thought of your x and y axes like these, then you see you could have your um, hyperbola either with its um, transverse axis, which would be this one in this picture, parallel to the x axis, and so then it would have its little central rectangle, and the center of the figure would be at HK. And measured from there, you'd measure the A uh, right or left, because we're talking that the transverse axis is parallel to the x-axis. And your B, you'd lay out this way. And you see, you calculate your B from the a square plus b square equals c square relationship. And uh, you'd have your focal points out here and out here. They're going to be inside of the curve and in the outside of the central rectangle. So then your um, corresponding um, formula that will define your curves will look like this, x minus h square over a square, and then the minus, and so on. And then for your asymptotes, you see, they're going through this point at hk. So instead of just being uh, b over a x, 
they're going to have slope plus or minus b over a, but the point uh, here will be at hk, so their formula is going to look like this. On the other hand, if your long way or uh, transverse axis is parallel to the y-axis, you'll have pictures like these, uh, and the center of your central rectangle would be at hk, so like this, and you're, you'd have a focus up here and a focus down here, and the, the director sees uh, that's uh, another one of these, you see, the plural directrix is going to be directrices, the I-C-E-S. The directrices then are going to be horizontal, like this, like these. So then you'll get this formula. So the, the A square for the uh, hyperbola is the denominator that goes with the term with the plus sign. It's not necessarily larger than the B square. They can be equal. In, in that case, you call it equilateral. And the A square can be smaller than the B square. So it isn't the larger denominator the way it is for the ellipse. It's the denominator in the term that has the plus sign. Well, let's uh, look at some pictures. And uh, I have a couple of problems done. Um, let's see, one more thing to say before we do that. One more thing here, um, <clears throat> if we want, we can study some relationships that involve the locating the directrix, the E, the eccentricity, the C, and the A for, for the ellipse or the hyperbola. This doesn't Im apply for the parabola, uh, really, because the parabola doesn't have a center the way that the, you see these things have a center in the sense of this picture that would be here where there's a curve over here symmetric with the curve that's over here. And the ellipse has a center in that this half is symmetric with that half. You don't have that with the uh, parabola. So uh, I'm thinking in my picture here as if this is one portion of an ellipse, but you can do the same uh, demonstration for a uh, hyperbola. So I have center and then the distance A out to the vertex, which you remember would be there. And I have a distance C from the center to the focus. When you have an ellipse, the C is less than the A. When you have a hyperbola, as you see here, the A is from the center to here, the green, and the C is over to a focus that's out here, so then the C is greater than the A. So in this picture then, thinking ellipse, I have C to there, A to there, and then the F to V uh, is um, the A minus C. Okay, the definition, if you say that eccentricity is C over A, which we do, and if we also say that eccentricity is the ratio, thinking of a point on the curve, distance to the focus, PF, over distance to the directrix, PD, then 
with these two statements, you can relate how far it is from the center out to the uh, direct and you can express that distance, which is x, you see in my picture, to the a and to the e. So if you look at the picture here, the um, x, which is the blue, is a, which is going to take you that far, plus this far, which would be P, D, if you're thinking of the point P when it's down here. I'm thinking P can be any point on the curve, but including if it's there, and if it's there, then P to D is this far. So um, the P, um, if it's down here, so if you're looking at a special uh, time in its life when the point P is here. In other words, if you're thinking of that PD, um, then um, P to F is the A minus C and the PD is PF over E, that's from this, you see, if you, if you solve for PD, you have PD equals PF over the E, and then the P to F is A minus C over E. So then that says that X, which is A, plus PD, which is a minus C over E, um, if, if you say that E is C over A, C is A times E, so you replace this C, with this AE, and then if you get a common denominator, you multiply this E by that A, now I have a common denominator, then those cancel, and I get X is A over E. So this is the formula that people use for the distance, thinking either ellipse or hyperbola, from the center to the directrix. Uh, it's possible to prove, if you have the relationships uh, we define eccentricity this way, which you'll see in the book, and we also define it as this ratio of these distances. If you, and then we also have x from there to there equals a over e. If you have any two of this or this or this, these three right here, any two of these, will get you the third one. So they, you can uh, put them down if you're thinking logic. Uh, you have statements one, two, and three. One, two, three, say. One and two will make three. Two and three will make one. One and three will make two, and so on. So you can go in a circle with it. Um, so look at a couple of the um, problems that are in 11 and 6, uh, problem 25, which is an ellipse, you're told the foci are at plus or minus root 2 and 0, and you're told the vertices are at plus and minus 2 and 0. Okay, so uh, this tells you the A values, that the A is 2, and the, fo the foci will tell you the C values. And then for the ellipse, you know that A square minus B square is C square. So put the 2 in there, and you have 4, and root 2 in for the C, and you have 2, 
And so you can solve for b squared, and that's 2. So you have a figure like this, where um, these are at This is root 2, minus root 2. This is root 2 up here, root 2 down here, 2, and minus 2, like that. And uh, so you have a figure of that sort, and then the standard form, your uh, A is two and your b is root two, so x square over a square plus y square over b square equals one. And uh, then finally if you look at uh, 27, you have an equilateral hyperbola. They're called equilateral, remember, when the A is equal to the B. And then your asymptotes, as you see in my picture, go through the center at a 45 degree angle with either the horizontal or the vertical action. And uh, so, <clears throat> You can, if you re if you think of this in standard form, you can imagine denominators of one. So it's also x square over one square minus y square over one square. So that tells you that a and b are each one, or a square and b square are. So c square for the hyperbola is a square plus b square. So it's one plus one is two, and then the distance x from the center to the directrix either way. Uh, for the hyperbola, you see the directrices are going to come in at right angles to your transverse axis, and they're going to be inside the central rectangle. They're in between the curves. So you look at my drawings over here. You have a directrix there, and you have a directrix there. This is very much the same picture. And uh, if you're sitting on this side of the room, it's probably easier to look at this one. So um, they're, they're inside like that, and what we have derived, although our derivation here, we were doing it for the ellipse, it's also true for the hyperbola that the distance from the center to the directrix x is a over e. So you could think of it here that the a over e would be between there and there. That want to look at that picture or look at this one. I have my directrices in here. And so the A again is 1. And uh, your, your C for uh, this problem 27 uh, <coughs> was uh, square root of 2. So 1 over uh, x is A over E. You have 1 over square root of 2, uh, which is about 0.7. So if it's 1 from the center to there, then this is placed approximately right. Square root of 1 over the square root of 2, or square root of 2 over 2 is uh, 0.707. Well, let's look a little bit at uh, our maple. Um, <clears throat> so I'm not sure that I have. You see what you can do there. Um, 
the, the first problems in 11.6 where they're uh, talking about matching graphs, problem one through four, they give you, they, they draw some pictures and they give you some formulas and you're supposed to identify which picture goes with which formula. And uh, so, for example, if you wanted to draw the, the easiest thing to do if you're using machinery is simply to get it to draw all of the pictures for all of the formulas that they give you and then you can look at the pictures and see which is which. So that's what I've done with problems one through four. The problems as they're given in the book are x squared equals 2y, okay? So if you're given an equation, then use implicit plot to get the graph. So implicit plot, x squared equal 2y, then you have to put limits on each variable. So just whatever it suits your mind, x squared is minus 2, x is minus 2 to 2, and y is 0 to 4, and you see you have a uh, parabola that opens upward. In other words, you have <coughs> where is it? Over here, you see you, you have um, <coughs> something that would uh, be like this. Um, where the h and the k are zero. So it's, it's really, it's your basic x, um, one that we started with, where the vertex is at the origin. Uh, <clears throat> it's uh, where the two would be four p. So the distance then from the focus to the vertex is one quarter of the coefficient of y, which is one quarter of two, so it, it would be at a half. And if you look at the maple picture, you see it, it shows the curve coming almost down to the origin, but not quite. You see, it's crossing the vertical axis actually at one half. And uh, so uh, then if you look at the next one, implicit plot x squared is minus 6y. You see it opens downward because of the minus. And again, the, uh, the 6 is the 4p, so the p would be 6 over 4. So it would be at 1 and a half, and so on. And, uh, <laughs> then, um, if you look at y squared equals 8x, that one opens sideways to the right. And again, uh, one quarter of the uh, coefficient on the x would be uh, the uh, location of the focus. And uh, <clears throat> then finally, the last one would be uh, implicit plot uh, y squared is minus 4x. And you see that's opening to the left because of the minus. And uh, the distance from the vertex to the uh, <clears throat> focus there would be 1. So the focus is inside in each case. It, the the, the uh, maple drawing doesn't really locate the focus, but you can figure out where it would be from the fact that it's uh, one quarter of the coefficient on the ladder that's first power. Okay, then I have some sketches of ellipses. So if you look at it's problem 17 in the book, 
and you see they give you 16x squared plus 25y squared is 400. So to put it in standard form, divide by the 400, and uh, 16 times 25 is 400. So you're going to have x squared over 25 plus y squared over 16 equals 1. So the A is going to be 5, and the B is going to be 4. And uh, <clears throat> turn the page, and you see your long way is horizontal. <coughs> uh, major axis is along the x-axis, and uh, the maple doesn't really locate the numbers 5 and minus 5, but that's where your vertex points would be. And going the other way, your crossing points are at 4 and minus 4. And uh, <clears throat> then I've also done uh, problem 20, and uh, that one goes vertically. Um, if you want the scale to be consistent on the horizontal and the vertical, you type scaling equal constraint. And uh, you see the <clears throat> hyperbola that uh, comes with number 27. See, that's the equilateral hyperbola. The x squared minus y squared equals 1. So that's, <clears throat> that's this one right here. And uh, first I've drawn the hyperbola, and then if you want to show the asymptotes, you can get Maple to do it, but you have to figure out what their equations are, and then do a display, because then one plot structure is your hyperbola, and then another plot structure is your asymptote. So I've done... <clears throat> First, I've done the implicit plot, and then I have my equation for my hyperbola, and then I figured out that the two asymptotes are y equal x and y equal minus x. That's these right here. And uh, then if I do that as a set, you see I have the implicit plot and then the set braces, and I have three curves, the hyperbola, the two asymptotes, and then turn the page, and you see what we get. Okay, so then the rest of the uh, material is about section 11.7, the conic sections and polar coordinates, and that's next week. So. Please save this and we'll look at those pictures next week.